What's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explain, we're looking at Infinity Pool. Following a couple on a ritzy beach vacation on the island of La Tolca, a fatal accident exposes the resort's perverse subculture of hedonistic tourism, reckless violence, and surreal horrors. Hmm, sounds like my kind of vacation. Infinity Pool is the latest from Brandon Cronenberg, son of body horror maestro David. Yet already with three films under his belt, baby Brandon has really etched out his own particular weird brand of cosmic horror outside of his father's shadow. His latest feels like an evolution of his distinct style, is not quite as trippy as Possessor, and tells a seemingly much more straightforward story. Yet it also touches on many thematic elements that have come to define his work, like what it means to be a human, the idea of our own identity, and other existential concepts. That is all on display here in a freshly twisted and at times quite thoroughly hilarious fashion. The progression into total depravity is ramped up quite well, starting seemingly innocent enough before things go increasingly off the rails. A lot of these ideas of identity and what makes us who we are is presented through the self-reflecting journey of James, Alex Skarsgård, and it's a lot of fun seeing him playing against his typical beefcake type. But perhaps unsurprisingly, it's Mia Goth who steals the show again. Oh, and guess what? She's a complete lunatic. I'm sensing a pattern here. But just like the ramping of the story, her character too takes time to shed her layers before revealing the true monster hiding at the core. Obviously, there is a lot to dig into here, and I'll make sure to cover everything and what what it all means. So let's take a one-way trip into madness with Infinity Pool, breaking down the story, the important themes at play, as well as explaining the ending and reasoning behind James's important final decision. In a dark hotel room, we hear an early morning conversation between couple Emily and James. They first discuss getting some breakfast before Em cuts a little deeper into James as a person. She doesn't understand why they're here. It isn't helping anything. He's so frozen these days. She can't tell if he's sleeping or awake, which will become a predominant theme as the story gets more out of Control. He tries to get closer to her, but she's more interested in catching the buffet before the omelet station closes. Hurry! We float through the lavish and quite empty resort grounds on the fictional island of La Tolca. James and M pass through the grounds, both dressed quite stylishly. The camera spins upside down, floating up into the sky. We see several locations around the compound, but it's all weird and askew, already letting us know that something is off here. A group of employees donned in traditional Iki masks inform the crowd about the meaning of the upcoming rainy season for the locals. It's known as the summoning, and they celebrate with music, food, and good company. Each guest is bestowed with color spots near their eye to signify the friendship they share by closing the season together. Oh, and don't forget, you can get your own Iki mask right down at the gift shop. Already showing us how the local traditions have been reappropriated and corrupted by the tourists. James sullenly joins M for breakfast, and he too is feeling odd about the place. Where are we anyway? She reminds him that this was his idea, and pokes at him once more. You feeling inspired yet? She doesn't really wait for an answer, and goes on about booking a boat tour for later, as well as reservations at a Chinese restaurant in town. James is unwilling to even entertain the idea of doing dinner again in town. The idea itself is even confounding. Why would they have a Chinese place on La Tolka? M asks to be excused, saying that she'll meet him on the beach later. So we already have some general idea of James as a character already. He's struggling for inspiration, and also seems to be just kind of completely checked out, kind of robotically going through the motions of his boring ass life. That all changes when he strolls down the beach, coming to a clamoring crowd. There's a local guy on a four-wheeler tearing up the sand as people watch on. James is mortified, covering his mouth at the sight. I'm not sure what is exactly so scary, and that's kind of the point too. From his appearance, you would think James would be a much more masculine sort of a guy, as Skarsgård has played many times. I mean, Tarzan, hello! However, James is a long way from his previous loincloth incarnation. He chokes out to no one. What is going on? And a random lady, Gabby, informs him that it's a local trying to make a statement. As for what kind exactly, they are apparently not huge fans of the tourists being on their island. According to her, what they like to see is all of them killed and hung up at the airport with all the others. Hmm. James finds that a bit extreme, and Gabby tells him, well, the Latolkins are a quite dramatic people. Then she surprisingly reveals that not only has she read his book, but she loved it. James is taken aback, but thanks her. After all, not too many have read it. They formally introduce themselves, and she brings over her husband, Alban. He remembers the book too, and Gabby gushes that it's brilliant. James clearly is unused to compliments and revels in the moment. She invites him to dinner to get to know him a little better, and they already have reservations at Yang which must be the Chinese restaurant M mentioned that he actively refused to check out. Looks like Gabby's positivity has changed his tune. At the restaurant, which does look like a typical bastardized Chinese establishment, Gabby describes 
describes it as a multicultural experience. It's certainly an experience, James scoffs. As for Albin's line of work, he formerly was an architect, but now runs a journal called The Glass Pane, and it's in Paris that the pair first met. Since she couldn't get work there, she made him move to the States. James weekly inquires, what does she do? Well, I'm an actress, of course. He has a contract in commercials boasting that they're grooming her. Her expertise is in failing naturally. The others don't know what she means. You know, finding a natural seeming way to fail at a given task. She simply can't go on without the product, you know? Albin suggests a demonstration, and Gabby places a bagel in front of her. She feebly tries cutting out the bagel, but just can't quite get it. It's impossible. No one can cut bread with a knife, she moans. That's why she needs the bun chop. James, do you need the bun chop? Well, clearly I do, he concurs. The subject turns to the extended wait for James's next home. It's been six years since his first one. Is it going to be coming out anytime soon? We'll see, he grumbles. Gabby is afraid that she offended him, and M steps in, saying that he hasn't been writing lately. Is it writer's block? James is starting to think that it's more due to lack of talent than anything else. He came here in search of inspiration, a resort, which he actually finds quite pathetic. They're curious in that case, what does he do for money? And M chuckles that luckily he married rich. Alvin knows it's good for an artist to have a patron, but after all this time, M fears that it's in danger of becoming a charitable organization. She half jokes, clearly also fed up with supporting him with nothing to show for it. Gabby eyes James, and it looks like she is starting to pick up on those core issues for him as a person. After dinner, they cut a rug on the creepy slow motion dance floor, or at least Gabby and James do. He is clearly enraptured with her, giving her the goo goo eyes, and she stares right back with a devilish look on her face. In the morning, they are to meet up with a couple again, but M isn't exactly thrilled. They're essentially strangers, and they were told to never leave the safe zone of the compound. He's confident that they can trust them, while she thinks that he's just happy that he found his fan club. He jokes, hey, at least they're out there somewhere, and promises that it'll be a load of fun. Gabby greets them enthusiastically, and an employee has lent them their car for the day. The gates are unlocked, and we see how serious they are about security, with barbed wire fences surrounding the resort. They drive out on a picturesque road overlooking the coast, and it is much more naturally beautiful just outside of the resort walls, not getting the real experience unless you leave the frickin' resort as a point. However, things are far from luxurious for the local population, seeing them all living in rustic huts working the land. An obviously massive difference from the disconnected rich tourists staying in their fancy hotel. They arrive at a lovely beach to soak up some rays and fry up some buffalo sausages. James's infatuation can no longer be denied, as he can't even help but be bewitched by Gabby. Albin offers him another sausage, and James groans that he's stuffed. Albin jokes that he's trying to fatten him up, and he will be their final course. We'll fry you up and feed him his balls, like a real marriage. M chimes in, perhaps she already gobbled his jewels long ago. And Alban has to know, why him? He has no money. She chalks it up to daddy issues, as in her dad hates him. Her father runs a publishing house, and the one thing that he asked was for her to never marry a writer. But as her father was a monster as well, she married the first broke writer that spilled coffee on her. Now that's true love, getting back at your a-hole dad. The perfect foundation for marriage. That becomes more complicated when James goes off to take a leak. He hears someone approaching, and is startled to see that it's gay. Gabby. She takes a grab onto James Jr. and gives him a proper reach around. James has some very serious reactions, as though he hasn't had his pee, pee played with in quite some time. He gets increasingly animated and shoots his shot. There's something I have to bring up about this scene, which is related to the original unrated cut of the movie. Pretty much every review I read from its film festival premiere described a scene with a prosthetic penis prominently displayed. And at this part, I was like, oh man, it must be during this. So imagine my disappointment when no faux peen showed up. What the heck? you know? American cinema is so afraid of dicks for whatever reason. Let's hope we get that ungraded cut at one point. I demand penis! He turns back to her in disbelief. Like, did that really just happen? And Gabby casually strolls off without a word. Later that night, the party is finally dwindling down, yet Albin is way too drunk to drive. James offers in his stead, and before long, everyone else is passed out in the car. James isn't looking too aware himself, and it's only made more difficult to focus when the headlights start to randomly blink, making it completely dark ahead on the road. James fiddles with the switch, but the lights continue malfunctioning. He looks down and punches at it, and with his eyes off the road, plows right into somebody. Way to go, bud. The others pour out and are shocked at the sight. James defends that it was an accident. They need to call someone, the resort or the police or somebody. However, Gabby knows all about how the law works around here and puts the kibosh on that. According to her, they aren't civilized here. Their jails are brutalized and filthy and would certainly meet their demises if they were imprisoned. So despite their better judgment, the group agreed to leave the injured person behind to die. Great vacation. There's a moment of worry when they wander back to the resort's gates. Initially, the guards are uncertain of letting them in. Again, it's against the rules to leave the safe zone. They promise that it won't happen again, and with that, they're allowed back inside. See, rules don't apply to them. What he did isn't sitting well with James, who soon tosses his cookies, obviously racked with guilt. 
The other couple isn't even phased, leaving with a friendly, we'll see you at breakfast. However, soon consequences come a calling, as he is awoken by officers at his room in the morning. They sternly tell the couple to come along. They're taken through another confounding area of twisted pipes and derelict buildings. Him is hyperventilating with anxiety, clutching James's hand tightly. They're escorted into the police HQ, where they are quickly separated. He shouts after that he will find her. He's dragged into a cell and given a uniform. Left on his own for some time, James is forced to chew on what could be his fate. Later, a detective Thresh enters and apologizes for keeping him waiting. He assures him that M is fine. They were just talking, calling her a lovely woman. You must feel quite lucky. There already is some corruption to the case right off the bat, as it was the detective's Uncle George who loaned them his car for their beach BBQ. If his role in the crime comes up, it would be quite bad for George. So is James willing to lie about what happened? He's curious how that would actually help him, and it won't at all, but he at least would appreciate it. James agrees and then poses the question to him. Did he rent you his car? No, James grumbles. Good, the detective replies. He details an account of what went down more or less accurately, them fleeing without contacting the police after a hit and run and everything. This is according to his wife what happened. James is a bit surprised that M said that, and that is the case, the detective finding her quite forthcoming in fact. Sure, that is the true story of what happened, but it also shows us how easily she was willing to throw her husband under the bus with unknown consequences. Thanks, hon. As it turns out, the punishment is quite severe. According to their laws, if someone is responsible for the death of a man, his eldest son kills him to maintain the family's honor. They do it right here in the building. Of course, James can't believe what he's hearing. He's going to be put to death for what he did? The detective continues that in the case of there being no son, the state will do the deed instead. Luckily, the victim has two sons. James tried to plead with him and apologizes for his actions. I mean, he can't die, right? There is an alternative option available to escape his fate. Thanks to a special act for international visitors and diplomats for a quite substantial sum of money, the state will build a double of the accused to take their place in the execution. So basically, once more, if you have enough cash, you can get out of anything. It's also by law that the double will maintain its original's memories and thusly will also believe itself guilty of the same crimes committed at the time of its death. This is a lot for James to wrap his head around, and the detective lays it out pretty plainly. Would you rather be executed or do the double thing? Well, when you put it that way, let's hit the ATM, bro. Doctors measure all over his body and strip him down completely. A rubber cover is placed on his head, and a weird thing is affixed into his mouth to keep it forced wide open. He's pushed into another room, and he takes a step into a red gooey substance. The doctor lady shows him how to keep his hands and slams the door closed. James looks around in suspenseful anticipation, hearing some pipes beginning to gurgle. Another blue substance starts bubbling in, and the roaring of the device gets louder. He's overwhelmed by strobing colors and waves of light passing over him. There's a flash of what looks like Gabby dancing in the nude in front of a bunch of spinning lights. Amongst the flashes, an inky mask appears on her face. The flashing is more intense, and James's face is sliced into cubes. Things reach a fever pitch of insanity, and James comes back to completely baffled by what just happened. Yeah, get in line, pal. Em is there and informs him that the double procedure was a success, and now it's time for the ceremony downstairs. They're led through a room filled with outdated machinery and are brought to see his newly formed doppelganger. Also by law, the copy has to be an exact one-to-one -one with its creator. Otherwise, it's not admissible in court. He removes a towel, revealing James's own face encased in the red jello from the chamber. Em cries in disgust that it's horrible, but James is more intrigued by just how similar it looks. He gets closer and James too gasps to life to his shock. The officers then shove them out to the mandatory witnessing of the execution. In a large hall, the double is tied to a pole with his washboard abs on display. The real James and M watch from the stands on the verge of their seats. One of the victim's son enters the arena wielding a knife. He struts right up to James too, and James watches on with a morbid curiosity. His double sheepishly begs for his life and cries for M to save him. She's barely able to even keep it together, her lips trembling at the scene. The boy jabs right into his gut, and he keeps on stabbing, unleashing a fountain of blood onto the ground. Despite, or perhaps because of the brutal display, James cannot look away, watching intently as the life drains from his double's eyes. It's pretty clear that this experience has awoken something dormant in James, as a small smile crosses his face. But this is just the beginning of his journey to being reborn. After that harrowing experience, M is ready to leave immediately. James is still in a daze, staring at the ashes that he was gifted of his clone. She snaps him into action, and when rummaging through his things, he is unable to find his passport. Uh-oh, looks like he's stuck here. M flips on him, shrieking that they have to leave, but no such luck. He offers that she can leave, and he'll follow after as soon as he can. M has more on her mind than travel plans, and is disturbed by his reaction to the execution. You could just sit there and watch it happen, and she can't comprehend what is wrong with him. Lots, as it turns out. He blankly tells her that he'll go down to the front desk and see if they can help. He explains 
the situation to them, and they ask if he wants to extend his stay. With the rainy season fast approaching, the room is still available. It's pretty clear why he is interested in sticking around, making eyes with Gabby sitting nearby. He has to stay another week, and oh yeah, it's still under my wife's credit card. Thanks so much. She tries to apologize for everything that went down, and tempts him to come have a drink. It's telling that he doesn't turn her down after all the craziness of the past 24 hours, but again, he is more intrigued than upset by everything. Now a word from this week's sponsor, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. There's a lot to love about HelloFresh, especially just how easy it is to put together a fresh, delicious tasting meal. It's also great for saving a buck as it's 25% less expensive than takeout. And delivery fees, forget about it. Plus, cooking is fun too, so you're saving money and having even fresher and tastier meals at home. They also have a ton of variety, with up to 40 different weekly recipes to choose from, with something for every taste and even calorie conscious eaters. They sent me a box to try for myself, and I loved everything I cooked. The whole experience really couldn't be easier. The box is delivered right to your door, after all, and thanks to pre portioned ingredients, there's no waste. Plus, they come with easy to follow recipe cards with step by step instructions and pictures. So, in no time, you will be enjoying a delicious home cooked meal that you cooked. How great is that? If you want to try out HelloFresh for yourself, check out my special offer. Go to HelloFresh.com slash ending60 and use code ending60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash ending60 and use code ending60 for 60% off plus free shipping. She fills him in on their first experience on the island. At the time, Albin was installing an infinity pool, uh oh, title drop of his own design in one of the resorts. During the installation, a plate fell and killed two workers. Albin took the blame and it was then that they encountered the doubling for themselves to escape their crimes. I'll delve a bit more into this at the end, but already we can see the correlation between an actual infinity pool and the title's meaning. The whole idea is that there is no edge you can see forever. The same goes for James and his newfound awakening. As they learn after this, there really is no edge because there are no true consequences as long as they have cash. This comes further into the forefront when Gabby introduces them to their other so-called zombies that have all been doubled as well. Since they have gone through the doubling process multiple times, they no longer feel bound to follow the laws or rules of society anymore. They can essentially do whatever they want. One guy, Bob, is writing a paper on the doubling process and has an intriguing question for James. Does he ever wonder if they got the wrong man? You just wake up and have no idea. Perhaps the real him is the one that actually died. Did he just witness his own demise? James chuckles that he certainly hopes so. There's a lot of meaning behind that statement, but ultimately he doesn't want to go back to who he was before. Either way, he hopes the old version of himself is dead. Who cares if he's a real one or not? And as they mention, the double is an exact one-to-one -one copy. So in a way, what is the difference? James gets a bit overwhelmed and Gabby comes to calm his nerves. She knows the first day is difficult. It's like a new skin working itself into place. She too can tell that he has changed, in his case feeling something special is happening to him. She takes his hand on her heart and asks him to trust her. Before he can even answer, they're shocked by the sound of a gun firing. One of the group fires it with great abandon all around the room to everyone's amusement. Also noting that he got it from a cleaner. Charles has heard of his passport problems and offers to help him out in exchange for playing a little game. You're like, oh god, what is that gonna be? They propose a heist of sorts. Another big wig, the very same that placed the blame of the Infinity Pool accident on Gabby and Albin, was just recently granted an award for good work for the island. They want to steal it for themselves. It's all just a bit of fun. But also after what he did, Gabby feels they must retaliate at some point, or otherwise they will end up cowering on the ground to never get up again. They ask if James is interested, giving him further incentive with a gun to the ribs. He doesn't need to be forced, slamming the rest of his drink and shattering it on the ground. They first break into the gift shop and it's a complete farce. They're all giggles and rolling around on the ground with their gun, not even remotely taking this seriously. They each are bestowed an icky mask of their own, as determined by Bex. The mask gang rolls out and makes their way to their adversary's estate. They send in James first, who does so without a second thought. He tiptoes up to the door, but it's locked. To his surprise, it opens from the inside and he stumbles into the house. The rest gang rush after and take the lady hostage. The girls bust into a bedroom, bringing the guy out along with his lover as well. The others raid the house in search of the metal and do find it, everyone whooping in celebration. Naked and afraid, James marches behind the trio clutching a gun. Gabby naturally wants to push him further, asking if he's ever fired one before. She takes it in her hand, croaking, it would be so easy. Not everyone gets this chance. Again, would you murder someone just to see what it was like, knowing that you don't have to face any consequences? She lifts the gun right up to the dude's head, but James still can't do it. Another guy tries to play hero, opening fire upon the group, which goes about as well as expected. A few innocent people are taken out, but only Albin gets winged in the leg. They all help assist him back to the hotel, passing by a strange Indian Bollywood dancing show going on. And you're like, what the hell is the culture of this island exactly? Just 
bastardized versions of everything, I guess. Weird. <laughs> James takes them to his room, coming to a mortified M. Albin is bleeding profusely and yowls out in pain. The group are all arrested once more, but none are taking it seriously, complaining about the wait time and lack of water. Tretch enters and is unamused by their apparent inconvenience. He's had enough of them exploiting their hospitality and decides to make an example of them. The group is roughly rounded up and now they are growing a little scared. It's back to the murder hall for you and each is cuffed to a respective box. And now they are taking things seriously as it looks like they're about to die for real. Impressively, James fights off his captors and turns a knife onto the others. This is already a far cry from the first James copy who just kind of meekly pleaded. This one actually puts up a fight. It's for not as he is overtaken and his throat is slit. It's all a switcheroo seeing the real gang is watching on amused from the seats. Albin compliments his double. I didn't even think you had it in you, James. And the rest of the doubles are dispensed of. James returns to his room with the fresh ashes of another double. Em is there looking like she's at the end of a rope. He doesn't get what is wrong with her and she turns this on him, as obviously this James is not the James that she knows. Em looks him over in confusion and asks once more, is this a dream? Because that would make sense at least. She's had enough and decides to leave on her own and knows that she is already footing the bill. James callously tells her to run home to daddy, but as soon as she leaves, he regrets his words, shouting after to wait, but it's too late. He embraces his new persona, donning his Iki mask and smoking a stogie out on the beach. Gabby appears, eyeing him like the prey that he obviously is for her. She takes a seat, giving him the big eye routine, and he glumly informs her that M left. She thinks that's actually for the best, and in her opinion, she doesn't suit him. Women like that train men to make them feel weak. She knows that this damage can be undone, but it will take some work, and more importantly, some blood. Out of nowhere, she goes in for a passionate smooch, and the rain starts to fall, indicating rainy season or the summoning is fast approaching. She then introduces him to a local traditional root drug, Iki Gate, which she was able to procure from a guard. It's both a hallucinogenic and aphrodisiac. Oh boy, time for liftoff, Jamesy. The only reason that it's even around, as all drugs are outlawed here, is that it's considered to be religious. Again, the island's traditions are being corrupted by the wealthy for their own amusement. She lights the root and places it in a ceremonial bowl, offering it to James. He takes a whiff, causing him to immediately cough and sputter. It's horrible, he scowls, and she's hopeful that he'll come to like it. Gabby takes a humongous whiff and kisses the rest back in his mouth. He's curious how long it'll take to take effect, but it's pretty clear when random trippy colors start taking over. Yeah, I'd say it's working. Things really start heating up as things become a pretty much straight up cosmic orgy featuring the entire zombie crew. A colorful mass of twisting flesh obscured in the lights. Eventually things get so muddled that you can't even really tell what the hell is even happening anymore. We see James looking wide-eyed and bewildered by the experience, and a nipple starts to pus something grody, which of course someone gobbles down on. And well, that was quite a lovely evening, folks. Thanks for the total drug-fueled madness. This all certainly has a profound effect on James, who sinks further into his new, darker, and more deranged persona. The couple is trying to enjoy their breakfast, but it keeps being bombarded by rogue cherries. It's James responsible, spitting them at them while the group laughs and eggs them on. Charles has news on the passport front, and that issue is so far from James's mind, he responds with a befuddled, about what? He's told that it's the detective thrash behind the holdup. He is the one preventing him from leaving, in hopes of further filling his own piggy bank. Gabby encourages him that when it comes to strifes with locals, the only thing they appreciate is dominance over their enemies. They have a chance to strike soon, Bob learning that the detective is due for a medical checkup this very night. They roll out and James is looking way messed up. He's told to stay behind and they'll be back in a jiffy. Left alone, he stares off into space and starts passing out. No time for that, as a police van rolls up and James worries that they're after him. They accelerate and almost run right into him, but James leaps out of the way. The others return, apparently victorious with someone rolled out on a gurney. They get set up at the villa, including another batch of the root drug for James. He takes in a deep breath and then another to grow on, and he was really feeling that last hit by the looks of it. He swigs some wine and stumbles over to the guy with his head covered. He dumps some booze right on him, and Gabby tells him to show him your strength. He psychs himself up, flopping his arms around and speaking gibberish. He gets more and more animated, grunting around the room, and socks the guy right in the face. He goes for another punch and then kicks him to the ground. He drags him by his legs while everyone cheers and laughs. Gabby looks on quite pleased by his progress into becoming completely unhinged. He pummels him a bit more before unleashing urine right on his head. The others join in on the fun and James throws his hands up in jubilation. Gabby leans down and removes the hood, shockingly seeing it's actually another James underneath. Oh boy. Yep, yeah, they are messing with him again to an increasingly alarming degree. They all think it's a big laugh, but James is horrified and leaves. He holds up in his room, clicking into place every lock he can. Yet that isn't going to be enough to keep his new pals away. He's lured by the sound of singing from outside and sees the group below serenading them in their icky masks. There's a knock on the door from Gabby, hoping that he's not upset. It's just a joke, Jamesy. They 
pay the detective to make another clone of him just to have some fun. He stays mum, and she gets frustrated calling it pathetic, which she finds quite unattractive. In another twist of sorts, James goes under the sink and retrieves his passport, meaning that he never actually lost it. He in fact stashed it because he didn't want to leave. Ever since the doubling, he has been intrigued by finding out more about Gabby's world. A lot of fun, huh? Although now he has finally reached his own limit and attempts to escape the resort. At first, when he's on the bus, he appears to have outmaneuvered his freaky new pals. Tell he hears a horn honking and they pull up right next to them. James feebly tries to cower into the seat and when they pull back up, Gabby opens fire. The driver pulls over and the gang has blocked the road. It's into the line, Gabby shrieks. Now also seeing just how crazy Gabby really is, she starts shouting for him in a strange tone. Where are you going, little baby? She cackles. Where do you think you're going, you little baby? Man, Mia Goth is nuts. It's kind of hilarious. She addresses the others on the bus and promises to harm no one else as long as James gives himself up. She decries him as a spineless worm in a bedwetter who would give up his own mother to save himself. He finally gets to his feet and Gabby is delighted, cooing insanely to come here little baby. They further amp up the humiliation at his expense, slowly trailing him down the road while Gabby rides on the hood of the car, hurling insults about just how pathetic he is. A real sucky baby, you know. They spill the truth regarding their friendship. It was all a setup from the beginning. She's the one that actually picks out the marks herself. They've been laughing at him the whole time. He's just a little bit of fun on their vacation. Rude. She reminds him of running over that guy. And that actually wasn't a part of their plan. It was just that James is such a buffoon, he managed to get into that trouble all by himself. Then she digs the knife in even deeper. She's never even actually read his book, and this does get to James. She chalks up him believing it to her skills as an actress. She actually thinks it was quite vain he thought they had read it. It's a bit funny, but most of all, depressing. To really make her point clear, she reads from an incredibly harsh critical article on his book. The book has nothing to say and lacks the words to say it. The article concludes that potentially the only reason this book even exists is due to the author's publisher father-in-law. Dang, really call him a boy out. This also really helps us understand how much of a lie his life was, and that he was, in fact, not so talented in his chosen field. Yet another reason that he was tempted by Gabby's insanity. Something you haven't tried before. Her wine bottle rolls off the hood, and James takes the chance to go for the gun. He is easily dealt with, but does manage to make a break for it off into the wilderness. Gabby is disappointed and starts shooting after his direction. One shot does get him in the leg, seriously slowing him down. He groans to his feet and makes it to a clearing, finding a rickety old farm there. He's spotted by some people looking concerned. James weakly calls for help, but can't go on anymore collapsing. He regains consciousness inside the humble abode, and the girls must have tended to his wounds. A boy peeks out surveying him, which we recognize from the first killing, as in he somehow wound up at his victim's house. And even after that, they still helped him. Shows us the real difference between the locals and tourists. The boy smirks a big smile, and takes a seat on the bed. He starts gleefully choking James, who grabs at the boy's face. Flashes return, and he splits the face right off, revealing M underneath. M, please help me, she cackles. The same thing as first double said when he was about to be killed. There's several several more flashes, and then we see M surrounded by other people now in chopped up face zombie masks. Back in the room, it's now her choking him, while the others dance around. She continues laughing, and James splits her head further open. There's a splatter of blood, and the sound of the fateful car accident that sent James down this path. He comes to again in bed, but there's no one else in the house, leaving him wondering once more, is this a dream or reality? He walks outside, and quickly is completely lost in the darkness. Until a series of headlights flash on, and Gabby greets him with a look who has emerged back from the dead. Alvin invites him to come closer, offering his hand. James is hesitant, but does still do as told. They promise that today they are going to fix him. It's been hard, but they want to help him understand that this is truly a mission of mercy. It's time to shed that disgusting larval mind of yours and find out what kind of creature you really are. Bring the dog, she orders. Bex leads it out, also clutching a bowl of the root drug. It's actually the other James, now on all fours and with a leash. She holds out the bowl for him to take a whiff, and dog James breathes deeply and begins to grunt primally. Gabby explains that the dog is here for him to complete his transformation. Just as she said back on the beach, it's only through blood that you can truly unleash yourself from your past. James is handed a blade, looking quite shaken up. Sacrifice the dog, Gabby lays out, as the final stage of his journey of self-discovery. He refuses, which only amuses her. She tells him to pick it up. He shakes his head no, until she motivates him with a gun, knowing this is truly for his own good. You pick it up, he retorts defiantly, and tosses the blade away. Dog Dog James makes the first move, and the two tussle on the ground. Dog James bites at his arms and is unrelenting in his strikes. He gets his hand around his throat, and James attempts to keep him at bay, looking like he is going to lose the battle with 
attacked himself. He digs down deep and growls, achieving the upper hand. He unleashes a flurry of punches upon his double dog's head until it is caved into a pile of gristle and bone. Well, there's that creature Gabby has been truly trying to unleash the whole time. Yet after the deed is done, he still seems to shirk back into his cowering nature. But this time, Gabby takes him in her arms. As he sniffles in her bosom, she rubs her fingers on his blood-stained hand. She applies some onto her nipple, offering it to James, who gratefully suckles down. He has effectively been reborn, reborn in blood, just as Gabby had intended. The question is, what will become of James? Will he return to his old life or embrace the new one? In the morning, he's on the phone with M, telling her of his flight plans and saying he's genuinely sorry. I miss you, he croaks. He ramps up his impressive three urn collection with extra padding to keep them safe. He waits by the bus and bumps into his friends, but they have reverted back to their kind of real life selves, actually fake, another form of the masks people wear. The couples chatter about mundane things like scheduling a gardener or that Gabby redecorates the house whenever she's bored. James watches on stupefied. How can they pretend like none of that happened? At the airport, Gabby and Album give him a casual goodbye and James is still left wondering what in the fuck? Seriously? He looks around at the others all awaiting to return home themselves. The drone of their chatter takes over, the nonsense swelling before fading away. The gate is now mostly empty, but James is still there. An announcer calls that it's the final boarding call for Melbourne. James looks at his ticket and passport, weighing the decision heavily before him. He ultimately decides to stay, the resort now closed for the rainy season, seeing it cascading down the windows. The bar sits empty, and the high tide splashes up from the beach. James is sitting there, completely soaked, looking steely-eyed out into the water. His ultimate choice was clear. He can no longer pretend to be who he once was after his life-changing vacation. There's certainly a lot of different factors at play from what it means to be a person, co-opting island culture, clones, and so much more. But front and center is James's rebirth as a man, unshackled from his old, unfulfilling life. When he first came to the island, he was bored and in search of inspiration for his writing, or really the meaning in his own life. The problem being he was pursuing this muse with misguided intentions because he has lost touch with what even is reality thanks to his wealthy wife. This becomes his journey to be confronted with this idea of reality and in a way his own identity represented in all forms. Is it a dream, a drug addled hallucination, or what? No matter the interpretation, its central purpose is to guide us through James's rebirth as a person. And we also, of course, see that clear divide between the consequence free wealthy and the hardworking locals there to bend to their will at every moment. Before meeting Gabby, James was repressed for a variety of reasons and essentially created a facade of himself to fit in. He really wasn't a writer. He was just another person struggling in desperate search of meaning. This seemed to nod him in a way over time, and that's what led to his desire to find something else. What he has been doing with him is a dead end, but he doesn't feel he has any other options. There's also the idea of play of masculinity and how it relates to femininity. M thought of James as beneath her, just a tool to get back at her father. She is always shoving him down and drawing into question his talents. But it's also only thanks to her cash that he's at this luxury compound and even able to save his own life repeatedly, thanks to more money. Conversely, inner Gabby who praises his work or really just stroking his ego. And she wants to push him further and into more absolute questions of what it even means to be him as a person. What makes us who we are? What is James? But really, she's just kind of fucking with him, pushing him to the edge to see what he'll do. Is there a limit? They represent very different sides of female influence. Gabby is pushing him for her own amusement, but also sees James's true pathetic and wavering soul. However, it's also only thanks to her that he can finally unlock and embrace who he is at his core. A deranged madman for all intents and purposes. It's also funny because James's decision to stay on the island illuminates another facet to his choice. Just before he decided to stay, he was still playing his fake role with M on the phone, all apologetic and whatnot. See you soon, honey. But he ultimately still turns his back on this to stay on the island. He is unable to pretend anymore. But this also means he doesn't have M's bankroll anymore either. So no more clones to get him out of trouble. What he was shown by Gabby now has a real weight to it because he can no longer pay his way out of his rash actions. This really adds an extra finality to his choice. He knows he can't go back, but also can no longer pretend to be who he isn't, no matter the cost to him, financially or more importantly, as a person. Perhaps now he can truly appreciate the value of his new life as it's the only one he's got left. That brings us to the conclusion of this inning explained for Infinity Pool. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you think of Infinity Pool and its ending? What are your thoughts on the story? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.